Welcome to Camp Constitution Radio with your host, Hal Shirtliff. This show is heard on WBCQ The Planet every Monday night at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. Broadcast out of the beautiful town of Monticello, Maine, up in the Arista County. And incidentally, I'm going to be up in Arista County this week. I do the show from my uh, from my home in Boston, Massachusetts, but uh, this coming week I'll be uh, giving several presentations. I'll be showing a, uh, the video Death by China in Holton, Maine on Friday night, this coming Friday at 6 p.m. at the McDonald's on Route 1, 110 North Street, Route 1. Then, uh, let's see, Wednesday, just a few days uh, from now, I'll be at St. Agat. It's some uh, people who don't know the town say St. Agatha, but it's pronounced St. Agat at Our Father's Place on Main Street. And that's going to also be at 6 o'clock. Uh, uh, no RSVP is required. People can order off the menu. I usually have a special there. And then Saturday morning, Presque Isle at 9 o'clock at the Governor's Restaurant. And it's a documentary exposing the free trade policies with China and how destructive they've been. And then some solutions, and I'll have material about the free trade issue. I'll also be speaking at the Rotary Club in Fort Kent, Maine. Uh, although that's, uh, and, uh, no, that's uh, I guess you'd have to contact somebody from the Fort Kent Rotary to get invited. That's going to be Thursday night at 7 o'clock. So I get a busy schedule. And this show was uh, brought to you by Camp Constitution, which, among other things, has a wonderful summer camp. And our guest, uh, I'll introduce in a few seconds here, is one of our instructors. But next year's camp will run from July 10th to the 17th. And uh, God willing, uh, Reverend Kraft will be uh, back again with his lovely wife, uh, instructing and teaching and preaching. Anyway, uh, let me bring on our guest, Reverend Stevie Kraft. Reverend Kraft is a longtime Camp Constitution instructor. He's the author uh, of a book, uh, Morality and Freedom, America's Dynamic Duo. And uh, he has speaks around the country, actually around the world. He's been to South Africa and other places promoting uh, godly values. And so, Reverend Steve, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Brother Hal. Well, this is, uh, this is, I think, the second time you've been on the show since we started in January of this year, 2015. But yesterday, uh, this would be, um, we broadcast the show, uh, broadcast on a Monday. Uh, right now, it's uh, a Saturday, uh, Sunday night. And uh, Friday, Reverend Kraft and I were in New York City, where Reverend Kraft lives in South, uh, New Jersey. Uh, but we went to visit the church in Harlem, led by Reverend James David Manning, who is very well known on YouTube, and he's got a, a very uh, interesting ministry. So why don't you just elaborate a little bit on Reverend James Manning and the connections you made recently and the importance of his ministry, uh, Rev? It's very, very, the ministry of, of Dr. Manning is very, very powerful. It's powerful in the extent, Brother Hal, that Reverend Manning uh, it's his church. His church is on 123rd and Lexington, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, Lenox Avenue in the heart of Harlem. And he has been there since 1981, preaching the uncompromising gospel and coming against the current administration in Washington that's led by uh, Barack Obama. Reverend Manning is a fearless warrior for Jesus Christ. You and I uh, were going to try to meet with him on Friday when we were in Harlem, but he wasn't available Friday. But what I did, I went back yesterday, Saturday, and uh, was able to meet with him. I sat in their 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock service. They have worship on Saturday. And he gave me the opportunity, as well as another minister, to give words of encouragement to the congregation. And I was so blessed. As a matter of fact, Brother Hal, I am going to, uh, uh, I'm, I was sitting here looking at the live stream, and uh, I'm going to forward it to you so that you can see through the, the whole thing, the whole presentation. Well, my, my part was only 10 minutes, but the whole second service was one hour and 38 minutes. So it's somewhat lengthy because they live streamed the whole whole service and put it on his uh his uh, Facebook page, but it was very, very interesting because he has taken a stand against the spirit of sodomy, the homosexual movement, 
that has taken over our nation with this counterfeit marriage law, uh, this ungodly law of same-sex marriage that the Supreme Court passed. Reverend Manning has taken a stand against that very vocally. He produces a program, a live television show, Monday through Friday, called the David Manning Report. Uh, By the way, I think it's important to point out that there wasn't actually a law passed there were two uh, narcissistic men that uh, moved out of, I think it was California, to another state, and they demanded that their uh, f- their f- counterfeit marriage be acknowledged in that state. And as a result of that, the Supreme Court said to all of the states that have laws against this so-called this thing called homosexual or same-sex marriage have to be taken down. And uh, so the whole, but the whole notion that the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court never has that power. But unfortunately, too many people cave in. But I just wanted to clarify that. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. And Reverend Manning, as well as others, including uh, uh, you, I, and others, have taken a direct stand against that. I was able to give remarks at that service yesterday, and Reverend Manning invited me back. I'm going to be going back, I'm not sure when, I think probably within the next week or so, to actually sit with him and do the Manning Report. It's the three-hour report, Monday through Friday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. So he said that his wife would call me tomorrow, Monday, and tell me exactly what day I am to come back to Harlem and actually sit in the studio with him and uh, uh, discuss the different issues of the day. Uh, he also invited me. I'm also going to be going back there to uh, to preach in the near future. So I'm hoping, in fact, I am pretty sure, because he did ask where you were, and I explained to him that you had to get back to uh, to, to Massachusetts. He wasn't able to remain with me uh, on yesterday. But I am planning, when I go back to do the Manning Report, to uh, I, sh- I shared with him about CAM Constitution, he took the material. I didn't get a lot of response from him then and there because he was so preoccupied with many other right. things. But well, I, when I go back for the Manning report, I will have I will have his undivided attention, obviously, because it won't be a church service where everybody's pulling on him. And uh, and then I'm going to get you. I'm going to have I'm going to ask him to have you in on one of the Manning report shows that, because I think that would really be a blessing. Well, I had a chance, the opportunity to uh, do a talk show with him a radio show. Now, I, at that point, it was about seven or eight years ago. Uh-huh. It was a, a minister in Rochester, New York, a black minister, and uh, and it, I made some comments. And Reverend Manning made something said something that I really don't want to believe, but it, sometimes he says things and he makes generalizations. Uh, but he said all black people hate white people. Well, we know that's not true. Right. But he's pointing out that there's a lot of ra- he looks at this racism. The blacks can be racist too. It's not just white people that are racist. Right. And I, I pointed out uh, there was a very fascinating book. It was called Brainwashing. It was written by Edward Hunter, the man who most likely coined the term back in the 50s. And what Ed, and you can find this book on Amazon for it was printed numerous times, you know, for about a dollar or fifty cents plus postage. Edward Hunter was able to uh, uh, interview and meet some of the prisoners of war, their American POWs during the Korean War. And he has a, a chapter on black, and, and, and the term Negro was, of course, the accepted term. Uh, he said the Negro is a POW. And I explained that they, they gave these blacks special attention. They wanted these black Americans to turn against the United States. That would have been great propaganda for the communists. Mm-hmm. But they were very frustrated in their efforts to do that. They only got one or two out of the, you know, how many POWs, uh, black POWs, and they said, they drew some conclusions. They said that few things. They said that the black, these black Americans have strong religious convictions, and two, that they lacked the capacity to hate. So it would point out, oh, the Ku Klux Klan and racism and all of the negatives of America, of the United States at that time. Mm-hmm. And in spite of that, in spite of the negative things that many of these soldiers encountered, here they are, you know, defending the United States, in prison, be, you know, on behalf of the United States, but still many of them discriminated against not getting full citizenship as guaranteed under the Constitution, et cetera. But they said almost to a man that it's their country and they love the country and they will not uh, go against the country of, of their birth because they love it. And because they lack the capacity to hate and they had strong convictions. So what does the enemy do when they find that out? 
first they get into the churches. I mean, if I, if I was a devil, I'm going to the schools to the churches. I want to destroy the, the faith, and I want to destroy the youth in the, in the, in the schools. Right. But they also started these organizations that promoted race hatred, groups like the Southern Poverty, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Southern, Court, Southern Christian Leadership Council, which is the word Christian is thrown in there, but it didn't belong in there, and groups like, um, oh, there was several, and of course the Black Panthers. Now, the Black Panthers had been around since the 30s, but they didn't really make make any headway until Malcolm X came on 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 the on the scene and very intelligent dynamic guy. So in other words, the enemies of America had to promote race hatred among the of course the Black Panthers and uh, there was an other groups like that that were or, that came out of from the late 50s and early 60s and their main mission was to promote race hatred amongst their fellow blacks. And they succeeded to, unfortunately, a certain extent. And Reverend Manning, and also the blacks community, and you know this, have been historically conservative-minded when it comes to abortion and homosexuality. Now, you explained to me that uh, the, some of the, the black churches in Harlem have actually helped the homosexual, militant homosexuals when they protest this church. Can you can explain about that. Right, right. I found this out just yesterday when I was with Reverend Manning. Uh, if you remember how when we were doing the filming uh, on 123rd and Atlantic Avenue on Friday, you remember that big uh, 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 brown church across the, directly across the street? Yes, yeah, so it was Manning? a beautiful old Gothic, old Gothic revival. It looked like an old, right, I you, thought it may have been a Catholic church. That, right, you know, right, yeah. right. And, we, and I told you, know that that was a, a, a Seventh-day Adventist, black Seventh-day Adventist church? Yes, yes. What I found out just yesterday, Reverend Manning had mentioned to me that that very church opposed him he said a while back there was a, a homosexual pride parade up Lenox Avenue, and it was raining that day, and the homosexuals were protesting against Reverend Manning's church. And as they stood in front of the Seventh-day Adventist church with umbrellas in the rain protesting Reverend Manning's church, which was directly across uh, the street on Lenox Avenue, the pastor of that Seventh-day Adventist church came outside, told the homosexual uh, demonstrators that they could come in his church, get in out of the rain, have hot coffee, warm up, and then go back outside to continue their protest against Reverend Manning's church. Now, the irony of that was not lost on me when he said that, because think about this for your listening audience. Here you have a black seven-day Adventist church on the corner of 123rd in Lenox, standing with sodomites, protesting another black minister directly across the street because the other black minister opposes what the Bible calls an abomination. Then, after he told me that, then, remember when we were doing the taping and that little right. AME church that was on the 123rd Street side? Yes, that was, it, totally, it totally abuts the other building. It almost looks like it's the same building. It's just built right next to each other. Right, right. He gave me the history on that church as well. That sign that you videotaped that said, we are not like that church on the corner, speaking of Reverend Manning's church. Right, right. says, we support President Barack Obama. And when I got to the pulpit to give my remarks, I told the people at, at, at uh, Reverend Manning's church, I said, now the irony of that is amazing. I says because when you look at the marquee, when you look at the marquee on that church, I said what you see, I said what you see is here is a woman, a woman pastor of the AME church who claims to love God, but yet she's denouncing the minister of the church that's adjoining to her church. And the minister that she's denouncing, Reverend Manning, because he opposes the sin of homosexuality, yet this same woman had on her marquee the scripture, Romans chapter not a verse I mean chapter ten, verse nine, and the scripture reads and I and you got it on, on your camera That's right. If thou wilt confess the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart Man believeth unto righteousness, 
and with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. And I told the people when I was in the pulpit, you'll see it when you go on the uh, uh, on on his. Uh, By the way, this is this is the Manning Report, which you can just go online, do a search, and you put the Manning Report. I think it's dot org dot org. You will see the archives of his uh, oh, his church services too, as well, right? Some of the services he has online as well. You just look for yesterday's service, tw- the twenty second of August, the pulpit of power, the eleventh. 11- 30 service, and you'll see it. It's the pulpit of power, 1130 service, August 22nd, and okay. uh, you'll see it. And the first thing you'll see is the praise team, women singing. They'll sing about four or five songs. That'll take a few minutes. And then the first lady, Pastor Manning's wife, she'll get up and, and give announcements and read uh, uh, the scripture passage. And then Pastor Manning comes up. He says a few things. Then he brings me up. So anyway, uh, past, uh, I, I said, that scripture that she used, quoting the Apostle Paul, is the same apostle in a few chapters before that that condemned homosexuality. I said, so here's this woman quoting the apostle Paul who condemned homosexuality, and yet she's in agreement with a sodomite president who supports homosexuality, and yet she claims to be a Christian minister while she is condemning another Christian minister, just like that seven-day Adventist minister across the street. So the point that I'm making to the listeners, Brother Howell, is simply this. There is a lot of confusion in the black community. Black people, I don't, I can't speak on that thing you were just mentioning about them people years ago. But right. black people can be very, very racist today. In fact, they look at a lot of things through a racist uh, uh, a lens, rather than dealing with issues like Dr. King said, not judging people by their skin color, but by their character. Black people have been trained because of the history of blacks with slavery and then 200 some years of slavery and then another 100 years of Jim Crow, racism is deeply embedded in the black psyche and in the black soul and spirit. And black people need to be delivered from that. And like you said, even though sometimes Reverend Manning paints people with a broad brush, there is a lot of truth in what he said, generally speaking, because black people, for example, I'll give you an example. It happened just today. I had to go back to New York, up to the Bronx, to preach at a little uh, a house church. And after I got done with my message, I opened it up. I already had church in the living room. And then I opened it up for Q&A. And one of the women in, in there got very offended with me. She's a social worker. It was all black, black and Spanish people. And one of the women in there got very offended with me because she's a social worker, and yet she's a liberal. Uh, and she said... Uh, uh, you don't understand, because I, I was talking about this bogus uh, movement, this Marxist movement of the Black Lives Matter. Unbeknownst to me, I didn't know this woman was a part of that, a Black Lives Matter thing. So I was, Of course, all lives matter, not just black lives, all lives matter. Yeah, right, but see, I didn't know she was in that movement. So when I got done saying what I said about how bogus that movement was, because of the fact that while they were talking about Black Lives Matter, kids... We're getting shot in drive-bys by the blacks. So she got offended. And she says, you don't understand, uh, Reverend Kraft, uh, uh, they're killing each other because of poverty and because there's no resources in the black community and because of this and because of that. And I gently said, no, young lady, you're wrong. I says, that has nothing to do with it. She, she, she came up with the old narrative, we don't have... Uh, We can't produce guns and manufacture guns and bring in drugs into our neighborhood. I said, ma'am, I says, you're drinking the Kool-Aid. I said, first (laughs) of all, even if the theory was true that other races are bringing weapons and and dope into the black communities, that still is would not change the problem because the dope and the weapons would sit right there until hell freezed over, until people picked that stuff up and began to use it. So she got quite offended because she, being in social work, had bought into the the lie that certain people are oppressed and doing these evil acts because of some other uh, race that doesn't give them what they think they're supposed to have. Let me mention this, this, though. Uh, You could have said, I know there's so much to say, but there are some people bringing death into the black community. It's called Planned Parenthood. Uh, No, I brought that up. That was Yeah, good for you. Yeah, that was, no, that was one of my points, and that, yeah. I think that's what got her offended, because I said, why aren't these same people that are uh, protesting the police 
with these Black Lives Matter signs, why aren't they in front of all these abortion clinics with those same signs? And I think that was part of it that got her so offended. But the beauty of the thing was, after I corrected her, even though I knew she didn't want to hear it, another little young black woman, uh, 20, 21 years old, corrected her, her herself. She says, uh, whatever the woman's name was, she says, one of the reasons why a lot of people don't want to change is because they're comfortable in what they're doing. And that's I, right. I said, that's a master shot. And this was a young woman, about 20 or 21 years old, corrected this older black woman who wanted to buy the, the old Kool-Aid narrative that, well, these blacks that are killing each other, they're killing each other because they live in poverty and they don't have any resources to get jobs. And I says, I says ma'am, that narrative does not even hold water. I says, what in the world not having a job or having resources have to do with you selling dope and killing somebody? I said, and this is going on all, all day, every day. I says, no. And then the young girl who re- rebuked her says, how many people have access to the Internet? Everybody does. <laughs> everybody right. has, well, Just everybody has access to the Internet. And even if they didn't, they could go to the library for free. Don't tell me she told the other woman. That there's no resources, no access to, to, to the resources. No, people are comfortable in doing what they want to do, and they're always looking for a scapegoat to, to, to shift the blame of why they don't get up and do what they need to do. And there, there are so many successful people, black, black Americans, that have done very well for themselves in spite of some of the discrimination they face. Uh, and, you know, I lived in a neighborhood, a high park section of Boston, and it became predominantly black. Um, we did. We only moved out because we had to help mother-in-law. He went just a few miles away, and we spent time and we visit friends there. Uh, a lot of a lot of homeowners. Um, a lot of people worked hard, able to get a mortgage and have a home, even rental property. Uh, they're doing, you know, they're doing okay for themselves. I mean, they uh, lots of these people are making a lot more money than I am, and I'm saying, hey, Amen. I'm glad to see it. I'm glad. Uh, that they were able to uh, get a part of the American dream. And they right, deserve- exactly. And that's you why know, this and- race narrative is so dangerous, because it's going to, it's going to uh, become a kettle. Uh, I was looking at some of Dr. Manning's uh, clips, and that's why it's, I encourage you, your listeners to get online, Google his name, and start looking at some of the video clips. There's literally yeah, if you hundreds- go to YouTube, and, and I tell you about Reverend Manning, if, you, if, if he had white skin, you might say he was a flaming racist. Yeah, he right. loves he loves America. He loves black America. He says some hard things, but he says some hard things about white people too. I never one and one of them he was uh, he said this message is to white Americans. He's really adamant, you know, very fine. What's wrong with y'all? And he's talking about the leadership that some white conservatives have embraced. People like Glenn Beck that he has uh, you know total contempt for. He said you used to have a man like George Washington. Now you have a man like Glenn Beck with them red sneakers on who's always weeping. Uh, and he's looking, you need to be, you know, you need to have strong leadership. And mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I don't mean strong leadership as a dictator, but people get their act together. Right. And guys get all weepy and I, I know we're emotional creatures and there's a time to cry and a time for the, and, you know, but the bottom line is that that's not the kind of leadership we're looking for. We're looking for people who are going to stand strong on, 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 like, a, like a rock. Right, and right. Here we and are if you remember uh, how, while we were videotaping, you remember that the plaque that you saw about what the vision was for building strong men that's leaders? Right. All that's right. right. All right. He wants to see uh, the blacks in Harlem become homeowners so they don't have to rely on other people to pay their rent. Right. They have their own businesses so they know what it's like to have a business and to create their own jobs. Instead of saying, oh, where are the jobs? How come a white man doesn't give me a job? Well, start your own job. You know, during the uh, during the uh, during the um, in, in the American baseball uh, professional baseball for years they had a gentleman's agreement no black players would be allowed. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until Branch Rickey decided, hey, we got. But what happened? What did the free market do? They created something called the Negro League, and right. had, so we're going to form our own league. And they had some excellent players to the right. point where they couldn't ignore these guys. And some place, you know what? We want to win some pennants. We better get some of these guys like Jackie Robinson and right. John Newcomb and. Willie Mays, and that's what they did. But the free market, they said they, could, they couldn't keep them from playing baseball. They just couldn't play on these teams. So what? We'll start our own teams. Right, exactly. And if we can't go to those white schools, let's start our own schools. 
Exactly. Let's have schools, and if we don't have, we can't ride on their buses. Let's start our own buses. Exactly. You know, I got a chance to visit Motown, uh, the museum in Detroit, uh, a few years ago, and the young man who gave us a tour. It was a very modest house. It was kind of interesting too. He probably wasn't trying to make a case for the free market system. He was just speaking the truth about what happened, and he said, the the uh, the, the founder Gordy Gordy um. Gordy Berry. Again, uh, he borrowed money from his siblings, started this, or, and he hired some great entertainers, and they were in big demand, and there was a hotel in Atlanta, Georgia, that signed a contract, and they reneged. They said, we don't want you. Yeah, you're all blacks, so and our audience is all white. So, so what did they do? They didn't have a big demonstration. They, they bought the hotel about five years later. They bought it. Exactly. And, they Ohio, and then, and then when they bust, there would be a bus. The Motown performers would travel throughout some some, some southern states. They said Klansmen on occasions would fire at them, fire their guns. So what they do? They fired back. And uh-huh. guess what happened? They left them alone. That's exactly. what happens if you shoot at people and you're a bully. They shoot back. You better you better back off. You see, and that's exactly. what they did. And that and that and that builds character. And that and look at Motown. I mean, they took off and. Uh, I think that, unfortunately, sometimes success got to some of the performers there. But the bottom line is that, yeah, even with all the problems, you still had the freedom to do these kinds of things. Exactly. I'm just reading, I, uh, we took a trip to the Apollo Theater, and I was uh, very intrigued by, I bought a book. I couldn't put it down. I'm about halfway through it. Just wow. all this, uh, you know, how these uh, people came there, and, you know, they had nothing. And they had but, but talent. And some in many cases, these people in a short time became very successful and white people, black people would uh, would visit, would come up to the Apollo and, and listen, and they'd sign big contracts. I mean, and it looks like it was sort of like the minor leagues of the entertainment industry. And many right. of these people uh, through through the Apollo ended up become quite successful millionaires right, because exactly. of the and free that's market why I system. You buy there, and I'm I forgot that you had purchased that book. I'm glad you yeah. purchased it, and I'm glad that you're into it because the free market works. And I told that lady that today, and she got offended. She says, well, I'm, I'm not patriotic. And, and then I said to her, ma'am, I said, tell me what country you want to go to then, then and I'll buy you a one-way ticket. She had, no response. <laughs> yeah. you know, she had no response to that because too many of our people have bought into the socialist Kool-Aid. And it's very, very destructive. Uh, so I was glad that I forgot. I totally forgot that I had taken you into the Apollo and that you, yeah. had, purchased, that you had purchased that book. That's good. That's good, Al. Well, we only have a few minutes left. This is the fastest half hour in radio. So I do want to, again, uh, mention that this show was heard on WBCQ, the planet shortwave, every Monday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We also take this show and we put it, we convert it to a video and put it up on YouTube, so the Camp Constitution YouTube channel uh, we've got a few back backlogs, but eventually we'll get it up there. And we do recommend that you visit Reverend Manning's YouTube channel. And again, it doesn't. I don't particularly agree with every single thing he says, but I tell you what: to be in Harlem, to take a stand for righteousness. I wish we had more. I mean, you're one of them. You're like uh, you're, you're, you're you don't have your own church, but you're you've, you've been promoting these values for years right. with your with your ministry. And a fixture at Camp Constitution. I couldn't imagine a camp without uh, without you and your wife. And you've been a real blessing to me. Thank and you. Um, and I'm hoping that we get a chance to invite some of Reverend Manning's. Uh, I'm sure he has some wonderful people in his church, and we'd love to get some of them at Camp Constitution. Yeah, definitely. And have I good... was very impressed yesterday, Holly. And I'm glad you had mentioned to the listeners to uh, Google his name and go into his website and go into his Facebook page. There is so there and the YouTube uh, uh, pages. There is so much good information there. So much good information there. And I will definitely let you know as soon as he schedules me for the Manning report, and then I will follow up on that to get you back down to Harlem and get Looking you on. Looking forward to it. To, to, Looking to forward to it. Well. All right. God bless you, uh, Reverend Stevie Kraft. And uh, uh, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye now.